All right, we're ready to go. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone to our first Intro to Robotics workshop. Uh, today we have a really fun curriculum planned where we're going to define what a robot is. Uh, we're going to describe the different parts of a robot and robot control. We'll have a brief introduction to electronics and then we will assemble our Hedabot. So here I have mine over here and we're hopefully going to help you assemble your Hedabot. I hope you received it in the mail. Um, and it's and if you do want to have it transparent, I hope you've removed the sticker because it does take a little bit of time. But those are our learning objectives for today. And at the end of this, we will talk about how you can use this to jump into more uh, advanced topics within robotics. And I, I really love this slide about, you know, what is a robot? Uh, I think for me, I have a very broad description of what is a robot, and I welcome all interpretations of what is a robot because I think, you know, there's just so much excitement we can do when we, we don't have very rigid descriptions of what is a robot. Um, that being said, there usually are types of things that robots have that make you think, oh, that's a robot. And they can be all over. So it could be the body, you know, the physical mechanical body is what makes you think it's a robot or the different tasks that a robot can do or how it behaves. Uh, what are the objectives we give to this? Um, typically robots are these autonomous mechanical systems that can achieve a particular objective. Uh, the original term robota is uh, from uh, Czech Republic and it means a menial laborer. laborer. Um, and I think this is something I want to just kind of pause and reflect upon because often in science fiction, robots are kind of displayed and interpreted as like these kind of evil beings. And that's totally not the case. Almost every roboticist I know wants to work with robotics to make robots a better place, uh, a better world. And they can take the jobs that uh, Carlotta has defined as the three Ds which is dirty, dangerous, and dual. Um, I had not heard the three Ds before, but it it's, makes so much sense. Like we want robots to take the place of backbreaking work, like literally labor that is so intensive and strains a human, uh, or work that is just so menial and like, you know, it's just mind numbing for people to try to do it uh, at the consistency and repetition that a robot can have. So truly robots are these systems that we are creating to help improve our world. And that's really why this workshop exists is because we need more people to help in creating this and making sure that when we do create robots, we create robots for good. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, uh, what are robots typically made of? And I think, again, this is a definition that is really broad, but usually we think of these electromechanical systems or the systems that have some sort of embodied intelligence. Typically, there's some sort of brain or computer that determines what it should be doing. The robot itself is a mechanical system. It has some sort of body. And within that body, it has actuators or end effectors, little grippers, uh, and it has sensors. And it uses all of those things to do some sort of intelligent behavior, whether it be picking up a cup or running around and vacuuming, vacuuming your environment. Uh, they're supposed to help in doing these different tasks. Um, my personal definition of a robot is a computer with really cool input output devices. You know, usually we program or use a computer, you know, in our when we use a computer, we have a keyboard and we have a screen, and that's how we interact with the computer. Maybe the computer has a you know speaker connected to it, and that's another type of output form. Um, but robots are 
basically like that, except they have very different input-output devices. So not only can they uh, have screens on them or have speakers, they can also, you know, push things or drive around. And to me, that's what makes robotics so exciting because not only like computers, you usually go up to them and interact with them. Whereas robots get to go outside of that box and they can interact with the world and change the physical state of it. Um, and that really is where it gets very exciting. So I am a computer scientist. That's what I do. I like to program and I program computers, uh, which, which are also robots. And so that's kind of maybe where you think the brain is. But really a lot of what we do is just programming, except the IO is different. So I'm going to follow up with okay, we have a computer, the brain, um, how can the robot actually work? What are the different types of robot control we might consider? Sorry, Ari, I jumped the gun. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, so how many people have heard of the Da Vinci robot? Maybe you can wave in the, okay, cool. Uh, the Da Vinci robot is a surgical robot that doctors can use to do surgeries today. It is like already being used out in the wild. And it's really great because it's minimally invasive. And that means um, basically the robot goes inside your body, but it takes up a lot less of physical space than if a human was to do the operation themselves. And one thing that doctors can do is they use these different tools and they move around. And this gets replicated by the Da Vinci robot in a very small minute fashion. So you can have broad movements as a human when you're, you know, manipulating this robot, um, but that results in really small, tiny motions. And so there's, there's so much, you know, great use of this um, because you have surgery that is less invasive. It's easier for patients to recover. It's in a way that we couldn't operate at before. So there's just tremendous benefits of it. So what exactly is that? What is that type of control? Because the robot, it exists. It's inside someone's body doing the surgery, but it's not uh, doing it all on its own. Uh, a human is controlling it somewhere else. Now that's called teleoperation or remote operation. And there's, um, this is again, the human gets to operate and the robot mimics what the human's doing or it does directly what the human is telling it to do. Uh, kind of going back to how I said the description or definition of robots very broad. Uh, here's a great example. How many people have seen remote control cars? Hopefully everyone's thinking I've seen a remote control car. Uh, at this point you're wondering, is that a robot? Maybe. I. I honestly think it is because you have a human telling the robot to drive its wheels around and the robot does it and it's, you know, there's some sort of distance and that's called teleoperation. Um, now, there are other types like, hey, maybe you have a robot vacuum and you press a button and the next thing you know, your house is hopefully a little bit more clean. Uh, you're not directly telling the robot what to do. It's just going along on its own. We start to call that a little bit more fully autonomous. Uh, maybe it's not completely autonomous because you go and press the button, but as you can imagine, there's these different levels of where humans get to be in the loop of instructing the robot of what to do. And the robot gets to do its own sort of computations and in, in a software to, in order to do its task. Um, and as we talk through those levels, it goes from, you know, completely teleoperated, um, not autonomous to fully autonomous. A human really doesn't get to be involved in uh, instructing the robot and how to go through its different levels of robot control. So kind of jumping from there, let's go to some here. It's one number out of a list of numbers or one value out of a list of values or possibly can represent uh, a range of things. So if we can go ahead and look at the breadboard. Um, so a breadboard is 
uh, a terminology we use for how do we connect all of these things together? So in the last slide we saw, I didn't talk about it, but we saw a, a LED, a battery, and that other little piece there that was representing a resistor. And if you are physically touching a resistor and you're physically touching an LED, you wonder, well, how do I make these things all connect? And so a breadboard is a type of uh, tool that we talk about that allows you to plug in various components and build your circuit. So on the far left, you see an example of a cutting board where uh, devices were actually mounted so that connections could be made. But as you move more towards the right, you see what is more of a modern day breadboard. So under the bottom, there's the ability for things to be connected depending on how you arrange them on the board. So you don't have to worry about uh, using your hand and connecting two things together and hoping that they don't come apart or duct taping them together necessarily. So the breadboard is the tool that we use that allows us to make those connections. So with all of those holes, how do we know what's connected to what? Um, so if two things are supposed to touch each other, uh, like they did in the previous picture, then we'll put them in the same row uh, of the breadboard. So as you see, I don't know why I'm moving my cursor because you can't see my cursor. Uh, but as you see, um, for example, on one row column circled in blue, those five things that are there would all be touching each other if they were plugged into that same column of the breadboard. Uh, some other pieces is that just like when we think about that light bulb that doesn't show any light if it's not connected, our electrical circuits have to be connected to power. And so built onto every breadboard, uh, we tend to use the convention that the color red is used to let us know that that is uh, the positive or the hot part or the top part of our power source, whether that be a battery or whether that be some more sophisticated power. And then the blue is what we call uh, the ground or you can think of it as the negative or the bottom of, of a circuit if you wanna think of it that way, just for getting started. And so remembering that if you're going to be building a circuit, you're gonna be building on a breadboard, you have to pay attention that the connections of the physical pieces you plug into the holes match the diagram, the description, the goal that you really wanna have happen. So um, it, the, one of the very common, th two of the, the most two common errors are things that are supposed to be connected are not really in the same row. You can go ahead and play a video if you like, Carlotta. Uh, things that are supposed to be connected are not really in the same row. And then the other problem that you often have is either your power and ground aren't really connected to uh, real life, uh, to, the, to the power correctly. Okay. And so as you look in this video, you see that um, there's a row, the A, B, C, D, E. Those are all, um, if you go down one row, A, B, C, D, E, those would be as if those things were all connected and touching to each other. And then over here on the far uh, right side, the F, G, H, I, J would all be as if those things were connected. So if, they jump, if it jumps across the channel, they're not connected to each other. Okay. Uh, just for reference, uh, the thing that is lighting up is called an LED. So a lot of times we use that to demonstrate back to a human being who's not going to touch the wires to find out if something's connected properly, um, that the light is used to give us back information to let us know that the circuit is working properly. Okay, thank you. Um, I might move a little bit faster through the microcontroller. So we can think about a microcontroller as being a baby computer. Um, and so the, the, it has the ability to control several different aspects. It can take input in from our power supply, our circuit, our sensors, our various tools. Uh, and it can also provide uh, make some decisions, do some processing, and then generate the type of output that you might need, uh, whether that is to um, make a light shine brighter, the faster something is trying to go, or maybe it's going to um, make a 
certain situation light up if it hears a sound. And so these uh, various components, or the microcontroller has the ability to take this input um, and convert it depending on what the needs are. So your particular uh, microcontroller is going to have in certain locations, certain uh, plugs and pins. That's the metal things that, well, you can't maybe see that. Uh, the metal parts that are uh, lining the side where you're going to make your connections, those things are called pins. And those are going to be connected to certain points of your microcontroller. And so as you prepare your assembly, you need to pay attention so that you are connecting um, your input to your desired input. Your processor is connecting the correct types of information. Um, so I think that'll probably be as deep as we're going to go into microcontrollers for today. Uh, so that's all the thinking part. But the other fun part is the robots actually do something. Uh, so we think about uh, tools called motors and encoders. Those are going to be um, actuators and things that are acting to create some type of response that's either going to move a wheel or it's going to move a flag or it's going to light up a sign. And so these various components are controlled by power, uh, whether it's direct uh, electrical power or whether it's some type of uh, device that does a type of counting as your motor can, can, as it may move, you may not be getting information just that the motor moved, but how much it moves tells you a certain amount of information. So similar to the wheels on your vehicle, it's not just that the wheels are moving, but if I can tell how many times the wheels moved around, then I can tell how far you have traveled or likely to have traveled. Okay, so um, if you want to play that video, if you think we have the, that few little bit of time just to see an example of motors as they are um, contro being controlled. So the amount of power and uh, the being applied to the motor can affect the uh, operation, whether they are um, spinning based on the voltage, whether they are um, counting a certain amount of uh, input to decide how to move forward. Okay, so as you see, as that is being controlled, the motor is causing the, I guess I'll call it propeller, to turn. Okay. I think that'll work for that, probably. And so you are going to not only have um, a microcontroller, but you are also thinking about a board to control your motors. So similarly to how we don't uh, just stick our hands inside the engine of an of a automobile, the motors have a lot of capability and so want to make sure that we are providing them the right types of control that they need. Uh, you see that we have this concept uh, or this term PWM, pulse width modulation. I won't go into it deeply, but I do want us to understand that it is an example that uh, as the type of information varies on the input, it affects, it can affect things like how fast the motor's turning, what type of information that we need to provide, and how it's interpreted further down in the, in the body of the robot. Sorry, I felt like I said that very fast. Um, and so, uh, as I guess we'll let you can start talking about the transition into building the turtle, but this is just another example of um, a robot control based on various size motors. So if you are looking sort of at the far left of the screen, you see that you've got um, some change to the pin on the motor. It might be a little hard to see. <coughs> So this one is an example of the DC motor because um, it wasn't in the same video as the servo. So the last one was a servo and this is a DC motor. So this is more like the motor that's actually on the robot. Thank you. And so um, at this point, you are all robot experts, right? Okay. But in reality, if you feel like you have 
picked up at least two concepts that you didn't have before we got started. If you can give me a reaction, a thumbs up in the uh, window, I feel like we're making good progress. I like the way that team consulted and came up with an answer. Yes, thank you very much. Great. Again, um, as I already mentioned, not it, once you've learned one robot, you don't know all robots. So we all are learning. Um, I'm thankful that uh, thankful for your responses. But now let's get to the fun part. Let's get our hands wet. Well, not wet because we don't want to blow up anything. But let's get our hands going so we're we, going to get ready now so we're about to start building the robot but mm -hmm. ari had a suggestion that we may want to take a group photo so is everyone okay with a group photo thumbs up thumbs down in the window please and then we're going to start building hey ari are you going to help me with the, the photo part i don't think i know how to do that <clears throat> And I'm about to stop sharing the slides and I'm going to share the Hadabot instructions because we're about to start building. We're going to build for about 30 minutes and then take a break. Right before the break, there's going to be an announcement from Black Women in AI. <laughs> okay. So before you start sharing, I think that's when you go into gallery view and then you should be able to see everything and then take a screenshot. Okay. Um, gallery view. Am I taking the picture, Ari, or are you taking the picture? Ari on the safari. Um, let's see. Either way, uh, make sure I can let's see. Go into my pictures, make sure I just was able to take one. All right, so uh, yeah, if you want to be in the photo, uh, put your, um, if you don't want to be in the photo, go hide your video. Uh, if you want to be in the photo, don't hide your video, and we will take the photo in uh, three seconds. So three, two, one. All right, I'm going to do one more just to make sure we got it. And three, two, one. All right. Uh, Thank cool. you. So let's do that building. I'll, I'll share this uh, with everyone. Oh, Shirley, I see your video just started. Did you want to be in the video or uh, I don't know, your video is doing some some wild things. Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to go share the build instructions, people. Everybody get your robot and your parts ready. We're about to rock and roll. Remember, we've got um, Jack leading the build, and our TA, Simeon, can go in a breakout room with anyone who needs some special attention. Um, I didn't mean that to sound in a bad way. Did that sound bad? I didn't mean that. Special attention. You know what I mean. Okay. So, um, Jack. Let me know. I'll drive, but let me know what, what where you want me to be right now. Did you want to go over to make sure everybody's got their parts ready? I think this is, uh, no, let's just uh, start with step one. I am going to paste the link to the instructions in the chat. So for people who want to scroll up and down themselves, click on the images to get the exploded view, you're welcome to do so. Um, so before we start, I uh, want to uh, let everybody know that, uh, you know, thank, thanks again for being here. Um, this is the first workshop we run. As a matter of fact, this is the first workshop that is uh, that that Hadabot has put together. So um, it's uh, Hadabot has originally been, really been meant for people to sort of work on their own. Um, so this is a very, very exciting where I actually get to work with people to build the Hadabot. And in some ways, you guys are a little bit of a guinea pig. So we're going to try to figure this out along the way. Um, I'm going to, as I'm moving forward, I'm going to try to refrain from talking about how all the pieces work because uh, for the sake of time, I think we just want to move forward to get the, uh, the robot assembled. And um, for anybody who has questions on how things work, I welcome you to always email me or email the group and more than happy to answer. But uh, let's try to just move forward for the sake of time to get everything built. And you can and, also post your questions in the chat. And while Jack's talking, we can answer your questions in the chat too. Right. And, uh, or we can compile it and basically mm -hmm. answer it offline. Yeah. Um, you guys are going to have start with a box of parts. I am going to actually have some half built Hadabots to show and tell. I think this, this change of viewpoint may help people with, uh, with the build process. So uh, I won't have individual pieces, but I'll point to you to the specific piece on the semi-built Hadabot. Hope that's okay with everyone. 
All right, so without further ado, um, let's start with step one. For step one, uh, the most important parts are we need batteries, bunch of screwdrivers, and screwdrivers of a specific size. Uh, hopefully all of you have gathered those components. Uh, when we say a screwdriver of specific size, specifically you have a motor controller, as you guys can see here, and it needs the screwdriver, needs to fit, the tip of it needs to fit into the screw hole. Some people have really fat screwdrivers and they try to do this, the, a future step where we install this and they basically uh, falter. So hopefully you guys have that all set. Um, let's move on to step two. I'm coming. I'm going to figure out how to make the screen so it shows more of it at one check so we don't have to keep scrolling up and down. I wish I could figure out how to do that. Sure. Well, any, uh, so for step two, it's just a kind of a visual inventory of what you have. Um, hopefully you guys have uh, gone through this and uh, have all the, at least the, the major bags of components. So we'll just move on to step three. Okay. So to the, the first thing we're going to do is um, build some, some of the pieces from the main chassis. For this step, we're going to build the main, the, the rear caster wheel right here. And if we scroll down to the bottom, if you want to grab the main platform, um, the caster wheel in, within the main platform bundle, and the inside the bundle, there's a little baggie of the four brass standoff components and four, eight of the little screws. That'll be great. Let's, um, let's see what's the easiest way to do this. When people are done, maybe it is, uh, if you can type into the chat, done, that'll be great. And I'll move on. Once you get these pieces grabbed, when you hit done. I assume people are working. Hard to know. <laughs> cool. We got one. Angel's Dude. done. Valencia's done. Yeah. Rose. So. so eight screws, four standoffs, and the caster wheel. That's right. And the main platform. And the platform. Yes, the platform. Now, Jack, question for you. Yes, ma'am. Which one? Like, is there any difference between the top and the bottom? Uh, in terms of the platform, like are those platform, two pieces identical? They're identical. It does not matter. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. But, uh, I would suggest just since you're unwrapping it, you might as well just use this guy. At least that's from habit for me. All right. I think, I think everyone's done because Haya doesn't have a kit, uh, for logistical reasons. Um, if that is not the case mentioned in the chat, but I'm going to move on to the next step. So it should be pretty intuitive. With the caster wheel, the four standoffs, and the eight screws, find the four holes that are equivalent to what you see in the image. And here's my platform. It'll be this guy. I don't know if you can see. It'll be this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. But it should be, hopefully, it's pretty intuitive in the picture as well. We're going to start installing the, uh, the platform. And the easiest way I find to do this is to take the screw, just stick it through the hole and use my thumb to hold it on the other end. Just screw in the caster, the cast, I mean, sorry, the standoff. For the other side, once you have the standoffs on, then you probably you need to use your screwdriver. So I will first put I will first put on all four ca all four standoffs first. So you're gonna have four standoffs. You know why don't I do this with you guys? And for those who are done, just uh, let me know. I think we have one done. No, oh done. Okay. Man, you guys are fast. Does that I know. done mean they got it done? I think I might have to put a separator because I'm not sure which is the last done and the current done. Or you may need to say caster done or, or screws done because they can't be done already. That was too fast. Or maybe some are. Yeah. Caster done. No, Angel says caster done. 
All right, so. We got one done, but here's my four standoffs and the screws on the platform. Oh, okay. Angel started before we did, so. Okay. Okay, so Rose is done. Okay, I'm done. Okay, I'm done. Deli's done. Okay, Shirley. All right, rocket. Okay, Valencia's done. Okay, okay. Separator, there we go. All right, so for the caster, just to line the holes, and now with the screw and one of your screwdrivers, I like the bigger one because it's just easier to handle, um, just screw it in. Pretty uh, standard Home Depot-esque type of screw in, nothing special. When you're done, again, put it up in the chat so we know not to sort of go too fast. Are we not using these as well yet? No? Not yet. That will be in the future. the instructor I feel compelled to have to finish before anyone else <laughs> and it's stressful it's like making me lose my screws haha uh, ha. was that a pun was that supposed to be a punny <laughs> not intentionally can we type questions if we have them yep either say it out loud Deli or type it in the chat I'll just ask quickly the caster the um the short ones are the ones that they're just taller than the caster for to connect the so we weren't actually done. To connect the this part to the frame, we need this small piece here. Well, I can't see which piece you're talking about, but the uh, in terms of the standoff, there should be only a set of four standoffs yep. in the bundle that you that you got that in this spe specific bundle. And okay. they're about that length right. in relationship to the caster. Yes, we have those. Okay. And, and then, the there should be eight of them that are the same length, Delhi. Do you have eight that are the exact same length? Use yes. those eight. Got it. Thank you. And the screw is, they're not very big. Hopefully you guys can... Uh, they're small screws, but they're just good enough. They're just long enough to easily get it and get the caster on the platform. All right, two duns. And then Angel's done too. Step 10. <laughs> she started early. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks good, Valencia. It looks good. Is it nice and tight? Yes. All right. So Shirley, we're waiting on. And Rose. Shirley and Rose? Or did I see her? No, Rose is done. Rose is done. So um, Shirley's done, too. OK, is that, is so that Delhi, complete? Delhi and Raven, and then we're ready to move on. So there, are, I should expect five duns <laughs> per step. I guess, yeah, because Angel's passed this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, including Angel, five duns. Is that right? Oh yeah, I keep forgetting Haya doesn't have a robot. <laughs> yeah, Haya, Haya is. Uh, we're gonna get him one. And Tanisha never came, um, which is. I'm gonna have to check on her. She, so we're missing one person that never came. Hmm. 
Hmm. I'll have to email her later. So D E L E is Delia. Uh, how do you how do you pronounce Deli. the name? Deli. Deli. Like Deli. Like, like where you like, eat. Yeah, like a sandwich. <laughs> like the okay. sandwich shop. Yep. <laughs> Deli, you guys doing okay? Do you need a hand or anything, or just uh? You all, we're wrapping up. You all can. Thanks for waiting. You know, no we problem. have a breakout room if you want to go to the breakout room with Simeon as well, if you ever want to do that. Okay, thanks for the reminder. We'll, use them. we'll probably end up using that at some point. Okay. No pressure. The parts are small, so it's a pretty pretty easy to fumble, especially under uh, under duress. <laughs> I must have built these things, you know, a hundred times, but uh, quite different when you have to do it under the pressure of Zoom. It's like a game show. Yeah. Okay. All right, we good? Yeah. Deli, we're, Deli's good. Here's a separator. So let's move on to step four. For step four, we're going to have to repeat this twice. We're putting on the motor uh, of the, for the, for the Hattabot, and we're going to do this twice for the left motor and the right motor. And it doesn't matter which side you decide to start on. Uh, we're going to, let's just, Let's just uh, conform to starting on the left side. So let's get our left and right first oriented. When I mean left, when I say left, I mean when you're looking at the robot and the caster's on the bottom, sort of this is the ground that it's going to sit on. The left and the robot's pointed forward away from me. The left is uh, my left, which would on your screen, it would look right, I think. No, it would look left on your side too. So it would be my left. Hopefully we're oriented. Right would be on the other side. Just remember, robot sitting. And this is pretty convention. For any sort of robotics exercise, generally we try to stay away from left and right. But when you, people talk about left or right side of the robot, they mean that the robot's sitting on the ground or whatever is upright, pointed away. And the left side would be our left and our right. Okay? So let's start on the left motor. Grab. Uh, in step four, grab the motor, two of these um, bracket posts or bracket mounts, and two of the long screws, as you see in the screen, as well as two nuts. Even though the picture shows the wheel, you can actually set aside the wheel for now. We don't need the wheel. All right, when you got the components handy, Show me a done on the chat. Cool. All One, one more, I think it's, uh, oh wait, a Angel's done, right? So we don't need to wait for her. Okay, on to the next, next step here. So we have these pieces. Now comes the, um, a little bit of, uh, we need a little bit of, to pay attention to the orientation of the motor. So we're, we're gonna put the motor on the left, left side of the robot. Here's the motor. I always get hung up on this. So I'm going to look at my own picture, make sure I get this right. We want to make sure the motor, the silver motor, is pointed back towards us. And the yellow part is pointed toward the front. We want to make sure the wires are pointed in toward the middle of the robot. So it will look like this. If you are confused or still need um, a little bit of explanation, let me know in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to move forward. All right, looks like everyone's good. Okay. 
Um, now we're going to take the post mount or these uh, bracket mounts. There is, there's a couple of slots here. There's one slot here and then there's a notch here on your platform. On one side, on the slotted side, stick your um, bracket into the slot. Mine's uh, because of the sticker, it's a little bit of a friction. Get, just push it in. It actually ripped off part of the sticker. It looks like that. Okay. And I'm gonna try to orient my motor again. Again, if I'm looking at it, the yellow is pointed toward the front, the motor is pointed toward me, the wires are pointed toward the middle. I'm gonna try, I'm gonna stick the wires. Um, I'm gonna stick the wires around the bracket and then just eyeball hold the motor in place of where it's supposed to be. You'll also notice some holes in the motor. You wanna align those holes with the holes in the bracket. Oh, there's a question about the black wire and the red wire. It doesn't matter actually. Um, the red and black is really meant just to visually be able to differentiate which wire is which, because when you start wiring it up, it's helpful to have some color differentiation. But um, for now, I know we are, we're accustomed to seeing red wire means power, black means ground. But for, uh, for, for this motor, just they're just different colors. It doesn't matter. Good question, by the way, Rose. OK, so I'm going to assume everyone's got that. On the other side. We have a notch. I'm going to take the other bracket and just place it over the notch. And we're going to eyeball the alignment of the holes to the uh, holes of the bracket to the holes of the motor. All right. So hopefully everyone's got that. Next, this requires a little bit of um, finger finesse here. Grab one of the, the screws. There's no right or wrong way to do this, but I personally like to first thread or, or stick the screw into the hole on the top. So there's a hole on the top and a hole on the bottom. And again, what top it means, if your robot is sitting on the ground, it, it's uh, this top here, the top of the robot. I'm just going to thread it through. One side, it's threaded through. The other side, you can see the thread of the screw poke through the, the other side of the bracket mount. If anyone's uh, stuck or confused, feel free to use the chat. Next, this, is, uh, this requires a little bit more finger dexterity here. Grab a nut. You're while, so there's no right or wrong way to do this. I personally like to take the screw, push it back a little bit so that it's flush against the, the, um, the motor bracket. So there's no thread exposed, but it's, it's still threaded in the sense that the motor can't flop out. And then take the screw and place it against the, the end of the thread. So it's basically ready to be threaded by this with, with your screwdriver. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I would uh, just take your time to do this. So sometimes it's a little bit frustrating. You can like drop your nut, they're not very big, but um, I'm gonna put this down and take my time doing it myself here. Okay, and once you, got, once you got the nut in there, it's underneath my thumb, you can grab your screwdriver and just screw it down. It's all about aligning it and then the screw should just, should pretty easily thread into the nut. Can everybody see that? Hopefully, if you can't see it, use the chat. Okay, when everyone's done with that step, when you hit the, hit the done or type in done in your chat so we know to move on. Rock in. Okay. 
All right, and one more, right? So Jack, we need to stay on this um, page because we got to do the other side, correct? That's correct. Okay. When you screw it in, it doesn't have to be super tight, but don't let it flop around either. You remember these things are made of acrylic, not titanium. I'm just gonna give mine another good good twist on the screwdriver, but doesn't need to be super tight. Okay, I think we got everyone completed. I'm gonna add a separator here. Okay. Rose wants you to show your your assembly again really quick. Uh yeah, I, I saw that and I was showing it. Rose, are you are you good or do you want to um do you want a closer different view? Okay, cool. All right, yeah, I think she got it. Or, and also you can look at the one I'm sharing too. That might also be helpful. It's a zoomed in picture of it. Can you guys see what I'm sharing? Yeah, okay. okay. Next step is not as harrowing. Grab another screw. There's a, there's a top hole and just thread it through. You might have to push the motor can kind of like twist the uh, mount a little bit to get the holes to align. Shouldn't shouldn't be that harrowing, but uh, you know, a little bit of a manipulation of where the motor and the mounts are in relationship to you, to each other might be necessary. Here I got mine, my bottom screw here, threaded through to the other side. Then I'm going to take the nut, the last, the other nut, and screw it in and use my screwdriver to tighten everything down for that bottom screw. When you're done with this step, pop in done into the chat. Here's mine. Cool, nice job, Shirley. Oh, you guys are fast. In about probably 10 minutes, we're going to take our um, break at quarter after. So we could maybe get through one more step. Sure. Let's try to put the other wheel on. Okay. You ready for me to go to the next screen? Well, actually, it stays on the screen because we need to put the other wheel on and it's just re replicated steps. Okay. The wheels aren't in this step, though. No, it's not the wheel. We got to put the other. I'm sorry that I say wheel. I meant the other motor. Oh, I thought so everybody already the, did both motors. Okay, I'll the, stay on. I'll stay down here. I think we're just doing one motor. The second motor hopefully is a little bit easier because it's just it's will be repeated and familiar. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Tanisha. Did you forget to fall back? Is Tanisha here? Yes. Oh. Hi. Sorry about that. Tanisha, I'm recording, so I'm going to make sure you get the recording afterwards so that you can see the parts that you missed, okay? Thank you. If you can, try to get your kit out and start from wherever we are, and then you can go back and do the parts you missed later. Thank you. Well, the Tanisha, Tanisha it's, uh, it might be hard to... I suggest, actually, if you wanted to just um, verbally follow along, and then follow the pre-recordings and or the instructions online afterwards. That'd be great because I think it might be hard to jump in in the middle. Like mm -hmm. you'll, you'll end up with a robot where uh, you might have to take everything apart to get the first couple of pieces on. Okay. All right. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. I think we're good. All right. 
So we're now we're going to, and I assume, I think Angel is already past this part, so I'm not waiting for her. I think I'm just waiting for four people. Uh, yeah, Angel's on not, step 10. Okay. <laughs> Grab the other motor. Same thing. I'm going to help you orient it, but then you're going to basically follow the same steps as what you did with the left motor for the right side. It's oriented correctly. It's just a mirror image uh, with the Hattabot on the ground or sort of virtually on the ground. The motor silver part is pointed towards you. The yellow part, the geared box, which is inside the yellow encasing here, is pointed toward the front. It's kind of like eyeball the placement of it and hold it in place. Grab another bracket mount, stick it into the slot. Grab the last fourth bracket mount, put it on the slot on the side. And from, again, there's no right way to do this. From the bottom, thread the screw into the mount and the motor. And carefully put the nut onto the screw. So here's mine for the right motor and double check myself. Both motors are pointed toward the back of the Hattabot turtle. The yellow parts are pointed to the front. All the wires are pointed toward the middle. Now I'm going to take my last screw and just put on the top, uh, oh sorry, on the bottom hole of the motor and complete the mounting of the right motor. All right, so here we go. All right, everyone's done. One, two, three. We need one more. Done. Oh, one. Done. Okay. Next step, please, Carlotta. Yeah, absolutely. Or do we want to take a break? Or you know what? Let's pop on the wheels because uh, that's sort of like a good closure. Yep, pop on the wheels, then we go to break. Okay, so the wheels, they fit very snugly against the white post. And there's a lot of steps here because it actually requires a little bit of, um, of uh, coordinated force to get the wheels onto the motor. Hopefully, it doesn't cause a problem. First, you'll notice that on the, as shown in the image, if you look closely on the motor, um, the motor stem here, there it's not actually round. There's a there's two flat sides. And if you look closely inside your wheel, you'll notice that it's also not entirely round, and there are some notches to hold to sort of clamp against this flat side of the um, the motor stem. Okay, so far so good. And anyone confused? Let me know if that doesn't make sense. Okay, I think we're good. I just, uh, I'm gonna pick any side. Let's see what side I pick. I picked my left side. I took a wheel. You obviously cannot x-ray view 
the, the alignment of those two notches. But what you can do is you could kind of feel when this wheel seats itself into the flat side. And the way to do this is you could put the wheel into the stem gently. And as you rotate the wheel, you're going to feel that slot cat, catch into the notch. And you can visually see that a little bit because the wheel is going to actually seat into the middle of the robot. Is anyone confused or we're good? I'm going to put a separator here so I know people are done. Okay. All right. So once you have that correct seating in place where you're rotating the wheel and you can actually feel it seat, the notches seat into the stem, ergonomically, could, Carlotta, maybe you want to scroll down a little bit? Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. So ergonomically, put your thumb against the motor. I mean, sorry, your thumb against the wheel right in the middle to apply the most amount of force. Put your fingers on the yellow gearbox. So we're, this is kind of critical here. We don't want to torque or put force on the acrylic mounts. And we don't want to apply uneven pressure on the wheels because if you do, you're gonna, you're gonna stick it in sideways and might damage the gearbox. But if you manage to hold it in the manner shown in the picture, you can apply the most amount of uniform force. And uh, once you're comfortable and you're, you sort of uh, have this, this hand, uh, hand position in place, then just squeeze the wheel into the motor. And this is gonna require a little bit of force. Don't hurt yourself here. <laughs> now I'm gonna put it down and do this myself. You know, when I put it down, basically I'm doing this ergonomically, but on the table. And then I'm just gonna squeeze and it pops right on. Oh, done, done, okay. For those who are having an, an incredible amount of problems, uh, there is some sandpaper in your kit to sort of sand down that white post a little bit, but I don't, I shouldn't be a problem. Deli, I'm look, watching the video. Are you, uh, you guys good? Oh, you're good. Okay. All right. I think, uh, I think that's it. Grab the other wheel. Do the same thing for the other, the other motor or the other side of the robot. Oh, don't we both okay? Well, Deli, if you guys want to take a 10 minute break, I think uh, we're, we're going to pause right here, right, Carlotta? We are. We maybe could try to get Tanisha caught up during this 10 minute break if she wants to try to get started. So, robot wheels are on. So, I'm going to the next step. Well, before we do that, uh, okay. stick the at the bottom of the screen stick your wires through that middle hole just that okay. gets it out of the way makes it easier to uh, to group things and um, know where they're at i also take the extra step to just gently twirl the wires together so you know that each group this this group pertains to one set of motor motors and this group pertains to the other set of motors they're the same color so it makes it slightly confusing but if you twist it together it's it'll help um, organize the wires for future steps okay I probably can move on to the next step. Okay. I'm gonna scroll back to the top. Yep. Oh, you didn't see six. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> the next step we're gonna put it on the wheel speed encoders. These are uh, I'm gonna refrain from explaining how it works, but these detect the rotational velocity of how fast the wheels turn. Oh, the necessary components are shown in the screen. You want to grab your one of these sensor boards. Um, I think this is all from bag C. So one sensor board, 
one of the long standoffs, two screws, and a washer, I mean a nut. You also not shown on the screen is actually uh, uh, washers. You should grab one or two of your washers. Actually just grab one, and here's a washer. When you guys have all the parts necessary, uh, let me know. You, you could have, for now, don't worry about the wire or this, uh, this notch disc that's shown in the image. And when you're done finding the parts, hit done or punch in done in the chat. I got two. Delhi and Valencia, there, um, hopefully you guys uh, found the components. I tagged done. I, I tagged. Okay, cool. I think we're waiting for Delhi and, but I'm, I think Delhi and them dropped off actually. Really? Yeah, I don't see them on the participant list anymore. So. Oh well, they may have had to go. Okay, well let's just keep going. They'll probably yeah, we'll watch just keep the video going. later. I'll send them the video. We're going to mount the um, the encoder discs. <laughs> we're going to first find the necessary hole on your robot on the Hadabot platform. And there's a sea of holes, but the right hole we want to look for is the one right next to one of the motor mount brackets. And it is the hole, let me see if I could get this out of the way. It's shown in the picture too, Jack, you got your picture. Yep, it's in the picture and it's also shown on the screen. Hopefully you guys can see it. If there's confusion, um, punch it in in the chat, but otherwise I'm just gonna move on. Put a separator. In that hole, grab one of the screws that you pulled out of bag C, put it through the hole. What shape is the hole? What shape? Uh, they're all round, but it's, it's... It's right here. If you're looking at the um, computer screen, Valencia, you see where my cursor is circling right now? Okay, yes, great. Yes, I can see it clear on the... Great. I got it. Okay. So uh, maybe, Carlotta, maybe could scroll up a little bit uh -huh. after you put the screw the screw in. I mean, sorry, down the other up. <laughs> <laughs> the other up. <laughs> the other up. Um, after you got the screw in, as shown in the picture, so it should be pretty self-driven through the picture. So I'm uh, other, uh, unless you guys want to see my specific show and tell, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna walk and do. You know, grab one of the washers and slide it through the screw at the other end, the bottom end of the Hadabot platform. Make sure, to hold, make sure to hold the screw at the other end so it doesn't fall out. And Carlotta, maybe uh, scroll down slash up again or scroll to the next step. Grab a standoff and you can just twirl it into the screw while holding the screw on the other side. The friction is actually pretty good, so you actually don't even need a, uh, you don't need a screwdriver. I could just use my fingers to screw that on. Jack, can I actually see your model again? I just wanted to see the full board. Thanks, just a moment. Okay. Uh... 
Sorry, and can you point to the hole that you just did? Yeah, no problem. Ah, okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, moving forward. Grab one of the sensor boards. It's, again, this is all self-driven through the images as well. Uh, orient the board as if, as how you see in the image. So if you are putting the board on the left side of your motor, you want to orient the, the sensor board so that the left, so that the hole, um, I guess closest to the side of the motors uh, is, is aligned with the post. So if you're doing the other side, it would be the other way. And then screw in the center board into the, um, into the standoff post. This is the... Can you zoom in? Uh, can, you, uh, can you scroll a little bit, Carlotta, to see it um, close up? Um, right, yes, thank you. Is this good? Great. That's good for you, Valencia? Yes, that's great, thank you. Simeon, did you have a question? Oh, no, no, no. I was, I was just trying to, yeah, the need to scroll so that you could see it. I'm over here trying to get our social media on, too. I'm multitasking. Work with me. <laughs> For the, the, um, the link to the build steps are also posted in the chat. Let me repost those because um, when I went out earlier, I don't know if it, are they still there for everybody from when my internet went out? Because I don't see them anymore. As a matter of fact, if, if you use my link, it'll go specifically to that step and you don't have to click next, 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 next. Oh, okay. You're the man. <laughs> All right. So for me, Jack, this was one of the steps that I had to kind of think about because there's a really tight, um, or clearance between where that encoder and that board needs to be. Do you know what I mean? You, you mean the disc? Yeah, like making sure this part right here is, is right over it, but that they're not gonna rub because you don't want it to rub because that'll mess it up. So it That's took me right. a minute to figure out exactly how to align that to make sure that, you know, I was over the top of the encoder disc, but I wasn't touching it so that they didn't rub. Right. That's uh, sort of uh, the, the purpose of that second washer in case there is mm -hmm. gratuitous rubbing, you might have to take it apart, add another washer, but let's see how people are doing. Right, I actually had to um, do that. I had to add the second washer to get the clearance to keep that from happening. Hmm, it's good, good feedback. Yeah. Okay. Is everybody stuck? Um, kind of moving along? Can we jump in a breakout room to catch up? Should the three pins be pointing towards the wheel, um, the caster wheel? The three pins? The, the, three, pins. the three pins should be pointed toward the cast. That's right. So they're kind of V toward the caster wheel. Now after you screw it in, you twist the, twist the encoder sensor board over. Okay. There's a, a little bit of play is totally fine. It's meant for a little bit of tolerance. Okay. I'm going to try to uh, make a breakout room, Simeon, for you, Deli, and um, Raven. Please um, take the link to where we are until you guys get caught up. And I'm going to try my first adventure with a breakout room. Yay! I see. Great. Okay. Yay! Um, just a reminder about the um, making sure that the bits of acrylic are pushed out because um, I had to make sure mine was pushed out. Oh, right. On the, on the disc itself, you mean? Yes, sir. Got it. Oh. All right, is it too soon to push forward to the next step or should we wait a little bit? How are people doing? Okay, Rose is done. You haven't used the disc yet, right? 
We have not used the disc yet. Okay. But for those who are done, you could use take the disc, make sure all the little pieces of acrylic on the disc are all are punched out. And the easiest way to do is take that small screwdriver and just to push it out, but uh, don't leave it around, especially if you have small kids, pop it in their mouths, <laughs> eat it like candy, do it over so, a garbage can. Deli and Raven and um, Simeon, I'm about to push the button, okay? Okay. All right. Do we know when we get back? Um, I'm going to say 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All righty. <clears throat> okay. I think uh, one, two, we're waiting for Shirley. Oh, Shirley's done. Is there another, are we waiting for anyone? Valencia. All right. So once you have your sensor board on and you twist it and angled into the motor, the, where the wire, wire connectors are pointed toward mm -hmm. the caster wheel, Grab your disc, and if you didn't hear before, you want to make sure the disc is the, the little slots here are clear of any acrylic that's stuck in there, and you can punch it out with your screwdriver. Once you do that, then just kind of uh, fit it into the white post on the other side of the motor. You can flick your uh, sensor board out of the way to do that. At the end, of, at the end of the day. As shown in the image, if we uh, go down in the image a little more, Car Carlotta. Mm -hmm. Going down now. Cool. It should slot in between that little U-shape yeah. um, shape piece in the sensor. And that's the clearance I was talking about. They cannot touch. Make sure they're not rubbing. It's, it's going to be closed, but you don't want them to rub. Right. If you're having trouble slotting the disc, into the white post, flip the disc around and try the other side because when they laser cut this, one side is actually just slightly bigger than the other side. The little uh, sort of pro tip there. So one side didn't fit very well for me, but the other side is like really, really good fit. And since I've been sort of tw twerking the, uh, the encoder sensor around, just want to screw it back down to make sure it's nice and snug on both sides of the screw. All right, so I have mine on for anyone who wants uh, show and tell. Oh, okay, Rose, uh, cannot get it on. Can I get this on? You mean the uh, acrylic disc, Rose? So let's see here. You have the disc. Did you try the other side? Hey, this is Rose. I'm going to mute because it's faster. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what is it? What am I sticking it on? Like underneath the uh, white post. Oh, okay. So you, oh. You, there's a there's a like I, similar to the wheel. There's a there's a not it's not a hole. I got you. So I have to move this um, out of the way, put it on, and then bring that back in. That's right. Okay, that's where I was confused. All right, thank you. No, no problem. Thanks for the question. Can we do it on both sides. Uh, yes. If, well, if you're done with this side of the um, if you're done with this, adding the sensor on one side of your wheel, do it for the other side. And it's just mirror image steps. And uh, you could use the link that I sent you. So uh, that, that one, you could to follow along to see where the holes are, which hole you need to add um, the screw in, et cetera, et cetera. And do we, is it flush against the yellow part or is it, let me see if I could see it. Sorry. You could push the sensor all the way flush no, the, we, the, uh, the disc itself. Oh, oh no, the, the disc will float on exactly. the outside. Yeah. Okay. So is everybody else okay with what's going on with the encoder disc other than Rose? 
Oh for yeah, long. I forgot to mention Angel's right. I had to clean up those holes too because there were a lot of um, spare pieces in them. But you know what? For the sake of this, um, that it's pretty easy to remove the disc afterwards. If you're finding it kind of frustrating to uh, to catch up with time and clean out the disc, you could clean it out later and just pull mm -hmm. it off and clean it out later. Carlotta, uh huh. Put your um cursor arrow. I'm sorry, my mind is gone right on the um yeah on that one. If you can move it over so that they can see how much space it is for that disc. Thing. Yeah, it's really tight. That's what I was saying. So like, even though it looks like they're touching, they're not touching right here. They can't, they can't rub. So it, uh, for what it's worth, if it's touching just a little bit, mm -hmm. it should be fine. Because uh, this isn't a high friction part and the motor isn't, uh, it, it's, the motor has a reasonable amount of tolerance such that it can, it can still turn a little bit. Uh, yeah. By the way, don't try to turn your motor when it's not moving because you could strip the gears. But if you just sort of use the play of the wheel, you'll notice that even though it's touching, as long as the motor can, can have a, that, that movement space, then you're, you're good. Here's another good picture too, Rose, where you can see it from the other side, how it rests over the top of the encoder, this bottom picture here. Yeah, that picture helped because I actually moved the black thing out of the way and then put it on, and I didn't yeah. realize it had to be in the middle. Yeah, it has to, like a U, it has to go over the top of it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I don't think this breakout rooms are closing, so I may have to pull them back. Cool, I got mine on. So I got mine, I got both sensors on my Hattabot. For those who want to see different vantage points, let me know. Okay. Jack, this is awesome. Um, oh, thank I, you. I think this part took me the longest and that's the reason I started at one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very technical. And I knew it would take a while to kind of get it, but um, these pictures are awesome. Without the pictures, I don't think I would have made it to no. the point where I am. So the pictures are awesome. Thank you. No, thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. So how are Shirley and Valencia doing? Oh, great, great. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just finishing. Um, the other side, because you got to get both of them on, right? Yes, I'm just doing the finishing the other side, just screwing it in. So just to um, set expectations here, it looks like we underestimated the time it would take yeah. to fully complete this. But fear not, we'll try to do as much as we can until the, the close of the workshop. I am more than happy to work with anyone uh, on Zoom, off Zoom, whatever, whatever is most comfortable for you guys to get this built. And uh, as I said before, this is a huge learning experience for us. So we really, really appreciate yeah. your patience in working with us to try to, uh, you know, flush out all the details here. Yeah, we just weren't sure how long it would take people. Um, so we can absolutely work with you offline or in another Zoom to get the robot built. And then, like I said, we're going to do the advanced workshop for the software as well. So Shirley, what's... Uh, um, What's, is there a specific point that you're getting stuck on or is it a, just a general confusion, which is totally fine? General, <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's see. Shirley, why don't, for the sake of time, uh, why don't you reach out to me after the workshop and we'll work through this together. Um, this is uh, definitely, you know, it's, it's a lot of small pieces. So I understand that uh, the, the difficulties, but moving onward, is that okay, Shirley? Can we, um, awesome, thanks. So moving onward onto step seven, Carlotta. Okay. We go. I'm scrolling to the, the top now. Sorry, my husband brought me food and I got distracted. Oh, 
<laughs> he knew I was going to pass out any minute. Okay. <laughs> so um, I remember Tamara talked about the breadboard before. In your kit, you actually have three breadboards, this main big one and two smaller ones in one of the baggies. We're going to use the main big one that's in a package okay. and take it out. And in the back, as you see in the image, there's a sticky backing. Very carefully take it off, but do not touch it. It's a little bit like crazy glue. Once you touch it, you got it. It's, it's become attached to whatever you touched for a very long time. And when you have it peeled, um, again, leave it aside. Let's go back to the actual platform here. We're going to stick this breadboard where the shaded part of the platform is marked in the image and where sort of reflect, and that's reflected in my post stock breadboard on my Hattabot here. The things to note are you want to make sure these two top holes are not covered. And you want to make sure that it's centered. So three things, don't cover the two top holes. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's centered. And lastly, when you stick it on so that you can orient yourself to the numbering and lettering of the actual breadboard, in, on the breadboard itself, you'll see A, B, C, D, one, two, three. Just make sure that's upright. So when you stick it on, uh, it's not upside down. We're still, hi. Hi. Everybody who's back from the break room, how did it go? Well, well, we were still on the previous step, right? The, with the encoder, step six. I think I you're on you back too soon. I think you're on step seven now. We are on step. Let me scroll up. What number is this, Jack? This is We're seven. Step seven. We just six, got seven. here, though. We just got on seven. Are you in the mid? Were you in the middle of six, Simeon? Um. Yes, we were. We were just getting the encoders on. So, um, Did you, how'd you guys do? Well, I mean, the we were just starting to get the encoders on the on the standoffs. What about Tanisha? How far um, did Tanisha get? Um, so I think she had skipped some of the previous steps. So she was only able to get the standoff on the, um, on the screw. Yeah. I just have the two encoders on the, um, in the okay. stand. So okay. we can, um, Deli and Raven, we can catch up with you all so that Tanisha, and, so we're not confusing the steps. We can catch up because we're pretty close, I think. Okay. okay. All right. I'm gonna send um, Simeon and Tanisha back into the break room. What? Okay. So what is Tanisha? Are you planning to follow on, or do you want to start from the beginning? I'm not sure what point. Well, actually, I was gonna ask this. Um, this sensor, the motor with the wheel, has to be attached before I can at, do this part right here. The caster wheel, yes. Okay. So, do you recommend that I start over, or just continue to watch? Which would you? Use? This is right. What do you think? I, I, I suggest maybe you follow along verbally, and then okay. afterwards, uh, as I mentioned to the rest of the group, we're pro we're probably not going to finish this by the by some feat of God. Maybe that's possible, but uh, um, and I'm willing to work with all of you to try to finish this uh, the Hadabot build, get the Hadabot completely built, and we'll figure out the logistics of how to make that happen. Uh, okay. But uh, to sort of move forward, um, so for all those who have not reach step seven let's just verbally kind of work through it this way there's a familiarity with what's going on in the future and then uh, i'll work with you guys offline online future zoom whatever it is afterwards that sound good to you carlotta we can actually set up another zoom um maybe another afternoon like this in a future sunday after where all we're doing is building for the next yeah. hour or two if you guys want to do that yeah. if that's something you'd be interested in put that in the chat um, Sweet. And maybe propose some dates, maybe stick with this time. I know it's not good for Haya, but if another Sunday afternoon where we do another two hours of building would help, maybe put that in the chat. How comfortable are the participants, and you feel free to comment in the chat, with trying to push forward as far as you can with just following the instructions online and then using the Zoom chat as a way to QA problems? 
Mm. So do you mean uh, try to get as far as we can on our own before the next Zoom meeting? That's right. That's right. So it's a uh, kind of like work at your own pace, try to get as far as you can. And then um, if there's confusion, we'll get together to kind of clear out the confusion. And maybe that will require a couple of sequences of Zooms, but uh, this way it uh, allows people at different paces to go without any sort of stress of trying to keep up with any uh, anyone else. That's it. And then we could do that for like the next 10 minutes or so. And then Jack, you could talk about the advanced options. And maybe since Angel got step on 10, this would be a good time for her to ask that question about what she had, the question she had on step 10 while we're here. Yeah, that sounds good. So um, Carlotta, are you suggesting we pause on putting this together and we'll sort of uh, uh, put together a detailed set of instructions for the participants mm -hmm. and a couple of options of how they want to work. Um, and we'll just move forward to the next part where I talk about advanced things you can do with the Hatabot. Is that Absolutely. What you're but before okay. that, maybe um, get Angel's question answered because I know she's been waiting. Angel, you had a question on step 10, right? Uh, yeah, I wasn't exactly sure how to put the... Um, um, you guys know what these things are called. <laughs> Into the wiring. I, I'm at the wiring part, and I'm not exactly sure how to do that. But I actually think that Jack can do uh, seven and eight. That requires more sticking stuff on, which would be helpful when they watch the videos. And I can wait for you guys to answer my questions. Okay. So we can do that, Jack. So, Jack, you want to go through the sticking on part and then talk about advanced options? Sure. But uh, how are you doing on time? We have at least allotted six more, there's six more minutes before we're- yeah, the workshop ends in six minutes, you're right. Yeah, I wanna be sensitive to other people's time and not, um, not go over. So maybe we should ask that. How many people have a hard stop of six o'clock, or well, I guess a hard stop in five minutes, wherever you are, since we're not in the same time zone. Thanks, Rose. Rose is still free. Tanisha, Deli, Shirley, you guys all need to hop off right in five minutes. I, I'm gonna hop off. I, I'm gonna have to hop off, but I would like to. I can go through the steps and then just send questions. Okay, sounds good. Okay, um, Shirley has about fifteen more minutes. So well, why do we do this? Why do we do this? Let's uh, let's do since Valencia and and Shirley need to go relatively soon. Why don't we do the advanced options of what we could do with the Hatabot, and okay. then we'll conclude with any other closing remarks. And then for those who can stay on, I'm more than happy to stay on for, I, I, I think I can stay on for another 30 minutes. Okay, and, sounds uh, good. and then after that, we can figure out, you know, we'll work together, Carlotta, along with and the come others. Come up with another and time to meet. Another okay. time and meet as well as a strategy on how to, you know, um, uh, get, other people get prog get the other participants to progress forward. Okay, sounds good. Cool. All right, so assuming you guys have completed a Hatabot, here's a completed Hatabot. This robot can run ROS, and the way you do it is um, a set of software, uh, a Hatabot software stack that actually runs not only on your Hatabot but it also runs on your laptop. So when we were talking about the brains of the Hatabot. This, uh, or brains of a robot, this Hatabot robot actually has two brains. One is the microprocessor that's on the board, but it's also using your laptop to do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of running the actual robotics algorithms. Because clearly this guy, this guy is just doesn't have enough horsepower. Um, the Hatabot stack is ROS2 native. So for those who don't know what ROS is, ROS is, stands for Robot Operating System. It is not really an operating system. It's more of a middleware software stack or software framework that allows you to program robots in a modular and shareable manner. So for instance, what do I mean by modular? One team can work on the drive part of the robot and another team can work on say the navigation algorithms that control the drive and they can be separated and the code the way that ROS is architected or designed is they're modular by nature. They, they encourage modularity. 
Uh, ROS is pretty complicated. I won't go into details in terms of how that design actually works. I encourage you to look on their website if you're interested. It's uh, ROS.org. ROS has been around for over a decade. And about a couple of years ago, they decided to refactor the original ROS 1. And now ROS 2 has been released, which is bigger and better and faster. And the Hadabot basically runs ROS 2. With ROS2, you can experiment with a whole number of different types of algorithms that are published by the community. And uh, with that said, um, I won't go into the specific details, but the, the stack, the capability of running ROS on this allows you to, to sample all those algorithms out there as well as program your own on ROS. Any questions? I'll stop there for a sec. It's a lot of uh, details. I think I had more of a logistics question. So when I down or more software downloads, when I downloaded the Docker, is that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Downloaded Docker and then um, am I also supposed to download Python too? Like, do I need which softwares do I need to like get started? Uh, you sh you definitely need Python. You need Docker. Uh, with all this said, what's what operating system are you running? I have a Windows. You're a Windows person. So yeah. I am currently working on a way to create a USB drive where you can set up Ubuntu on a USB drive and run Linux directly off the USB, USB, which is actually a lot more friendly to programming ROS as well as microcontrollers. Cool. Um, so, uh, but the, sh the, the answer to your question is you need Docker, you need Python. Python is usually installed in most modern operating systems these days. Okay. But just Windows has um, some funny ways of of, um, how should I put it, communicating with um, microcontroller devices that makes yeah. it Yeah, it said I needed something like a V, um, sorry, to, I just remember I was trying to prepare and I can ask more detailed questions later, but there are a couple things that it said that I needed for the firmware. Do I need the core Hadabot ESP32 firmware as well? Yeah, you need to program the firmware onto the Hadabon. This is where Windows gets a little bit hairy because Windows doesn't communicate with these devices very well uh -huh. or very okay. easily. But okay. stay tuned. I'm about to publish the instructions on how to create this Ubuntu operating system on a USB drive sometime next week. And Carlotta is going to send that out to everyone. So for all Windows users and maybe even Mac users, this will be an easy workaround and a cheap workaround to get your Hadabot working. It won't be the fastest because you're running off a USB drive, but it'll get it up and running. So, Deli, I'm also a Windows user. So, when we try to have that that second round of meetings, maybe to wrap up your robot build, we'll have that ready as well. So, okay. we can walk through some of that. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions with the, uh, the sort of like high level? Yes, Jack, this is Angel. Um, is this similar to the Spark Fun Arduino? Uh, no. Well, so SparkFun is a company that makes boards. Arduino is a specific um, brand of microcontroller manufacturers. So they make, Arduino actually makes a whole bunch of these devices across different types of chips. That was incredibly confusing. Let me try to answer your question in a different way. It is not like SparkFun and Arduino um, in the sense that uh, you can use whatever tool they use to program the ESP32. Okay, okay. I was going to try and create something else because I have the SparkFun. That's the first one I created. Right. Um, okay. Why don't you send me what uh, specifically you've done? This way I could better answer the question. It's um, the, the, the question is a little bit too general for me to give a specific answer to. No worries. For anyone else who has a question, and is, feel free to also just ask me via email. I think, I'm not sure if Carlotta sent, um, sent my email address to Let's put it in the chat, just to be sure. Hey, Angel, what operating system do you have? Um, I'm working on a Mac. Okay. Jack, please confirm that your email address is correct in the chat. Oops, I gave oh, the wrong oops. one. Didn't I? You know what? No, I gave the wrong one. Hold on for a second. <laughs> Type in one hand here. All I right. think it's Jack at Jack. Oh, it's oh Jack at Hadabot.com. Okay. Yeah, so I had the wrong one. Okay. 
or you could uh, jack at jackpn gets to me too it's up to you whatever you guys want to use it's actually jack at jackpn.com so that one was just straight wrong <laughs> yeah jackpn at jackpn.com might work i'm not sure if i created alias but any other any other questions any questions about ross who here has not heard of ross i hadn't heard of it i've never heard of it okay so uh, for any serious roboticist, Ross Im is arguably one of the most important software frameworks to learn. Okay. It, is, it does have a steep learning curve and that's one of the motivations behind Hattabot to try to, try to create a way to more easily make it accessible. Believe it or not, the current alternatives are actually even hairier than Hattabot <laughs> and more expensive too. It's like $1,000, a couple of thousand dollars for a, or a couple of hundred dollars for a cheap uh, ROS capable robot. Plus you have to install the software all yourself and it, it, the software stack is not, is not um, easy to install and or it just pollutes your system with all kinds of different libraries. So um, mm -hmm. things they Go need ahead. to have before, uh, well, uh, Windows users need, will need to have two 32 gigabyte USB drives um, to run the system on their USB drive. I don't know, do, do the Mac users or Linux users need anything? So for Mac, it, you need to install, if you follow the instructions on the Hattabot site, it should just work because I run both Mac and Linux. Okay. But if you want to avoid having to run to install a driver to connect your ESP32 till, then I would suggest just using the USB, the Ubuntu USB path, which we will publish um, very shortly. Yeah, so Rose, yes. If you're going to do the Windows option where you run it from your USB, you're going to need two 32 gig flash drives, which um, I think I bought mine from Amazon. I don't remember how much it was though. Um, you're gonna need that much room and you need two of them. But that's only for the Windows option. If you're doing Mac, or Linux, you don't need that. You can just follow the steps on the website. That's right. Or if, if you want to- Can you repeat that? Sorry, I was showing my niece something on the board. Oh, I was saying that if you're going to do the Windows option, you're going to need two 32 gigabyte flash drives um, in order to mount the system. So get those before we start working on the software. You can buy them on Amazon or however, wherever you get flash drives, unless you have some in your house. Okay, thanks. And I have one question, um, Jack. Uh, one of oh, my motors, one of DC motors, one of the um, the power lead, the red lead, actually came off um, just from handling it. It was a little fragile. Yes, uh, I'll ship you a replacement, no problem. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. And I still owe I still owe you a couple of other robots, I think. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, other Any questions? Part? Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Jack. <clears throat> No, no, no. I was just going to ask if uh, if anyone has questions about the capabilities of the Hattabot or. Yeah, actually, um, I I'm trying to figure out how to frame it. Actually, um, you mentioned that there are some algorithms that are run on the Hattabot. What are the type of, I guess, uh, directions or. Yeah. Great question. So on the Hattabot, I am currently prototyping the the use of the ROS navigation stack onto the actual Hattabot. In the ROS navigation stack are a whole bunch of algorithms. Um, a majority of them implement probabilistic methods for navigation. So for those who are, uh, who kind of are under, or are a little bit aware of um, robotics uh, and some of the uh, current latest, greatest algorithms, these include a lot of the algorithms in um, Sebastian Thrung and uh, Wolfram Bogard's textbook, Probabilistic Robotics. So they include particle filters, um, include SLAM, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, those, are, so Tanisha, yeah. those, are, those would be some of the things we were planning to discuss at our um, higher level workshop. <clears throat> I'm going to paste a link to the um, website for that um, Jack mentioned, though, for that curriculum. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All 
I might uh, jump in and add that, you know, Jack mentioned a few different algorithms that, uh, you know, there's this big textbook that you can read about to learn about them. Uh, but the real benefit of using a tool like Ross is that you don't actually have to know or understand them. You can download other people's code that they contributed with an open source license. So you could just use it, start running, you know, different software and get your robot to do more things than if you had to go and learn every single robotics topic on your own. Um, that it just, it's really hard to do that. So Ross has provided a platform for people to just start running software really fast without having to re-implement everything. Um, that being said, it's really hard to create software that works for a variety of different robot platforms. And so sometimes it feels really difficult getting into using ROS. And that's because they tried to solve a really hard problem, which is the same software that can program a humanoid robot, can also program a Hattabot, can also program mm. and so on. So because it's like such a universal software language or operating system, it becomes incredibly cumbersome to try to use it. And there are tutorials and workshops and robots like this that are trying to minimize that burden to make robotics more accessible to everyone. We have a question. Um, so my niece wants to know what is an algorithm and why are they important? I love your niece. How old is she? She's 12. Welcome, welcome Raven. Who's taking that algorithm question? <laughs> Ari? I, I'm happy to, to try to, to shoot for that. Um, so the first question was, what is an algorithm? And, you know, that, that one it just kind of takes me aback. Like, what is an algorithm? Um, I have a lot of different examples of what some algorithms are. Like, there are sorting algorithms, uh, there are searching algorithms, but essentially you have this, um, some sort of problem and you need to write software to solve it or to do it. And an algorithm is an abstract description of how you can go about solving that. Uh, I mentioned that sorting is one type of algorithm. There's a few different types of sorting algorithms, but suppose you provided to a computer a list of numbers and you wanted the computer to print out those numbers in a sort from minimum to uh, largest number. Uh, or another example could be, look at all of us in this Zoom uh, session. Could the computer print out all of our names in alphabetical order? An algorithm is a list of instructions that a computer can use to actually solve that problem. And, you know, how does it take a, every person's name and then spit out what are they all in order? Uh, and then that's kind of just like what an algorithm can do. But there's also different aspects of an algorithm, like is it very fast uh, or is it very slow? And you know, how is the performance if we have a really large number of people in the Zoom session and we want to you know, compute the algorithmic, the alphabetical order? Um, does it take a lot of memory? So those are different met, uh, ways of describing the type of um, performance or uh, attributes of an algorithm. Now for a robot, uh, going back to robots, like what's the type of algorithm there? Uh, one of the algorithms that you'll be able to run with the Hattabot is um, something about odometry, which is knowing where is, like, where is the robot relative from where it started. So when you turn on this robot and we'll eventually get to tell it to spin its wheels forward, um, how will we know how far it went? Uh, it has these little discs. I don't know if you remember the little discs with the holes in them. Uh, those are going to be used to tell you, you know, how, how are the wheels spinning? What's the, the RPM of the robot? So you'll be able to run an algorithm on there to give you odometry, odometry information that tells you, you know, where is the robot relative from where it started. And uh, later on, you'll be able to use more complex algorithms to directly control it to say, I want you to move one meter forward. Um, and you can do that because you'll have this input that says how, how many uh, rotations has the wheels gone? Uh, I th think there were like two parts to that question. I'm afraid I forgot the, the latter part of what, what was the algorithm. Why are they important was our second part. Mm, 
I think algorithms are important because uh, of the way they can give you just like this recipe for how to, you know, solve some problem. And then the way we can analyze algorithms can really help us improve and develop more complex and interesting ones. Um, and they really are all over the place, different algorithms. Uh, when you use Google, there's algorithms going on underneath that. When you take photos and somehow it figures out where your eyes are, uh, there's a lot of algorithms going on under the scene. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to quickly say algorithms, um, and I, I love the way Ari explained them. I, I consider them a recipe. If you want a chocolate cake, it's going to be different than, you know, a German chocolate cake. So that that's um, a way of explaining it. And the importance is that if you want a chocolate cake versus a German chocolate cake, the, the ingredients are going to be different. The importance is that if you say, I want a chocolate cake, and someone gives you a German chocolate cake recipe, that's the wrong recipe. And when we look at algorithms, they can be... Uh, I, I won't say planned, they, they can be um, corrected or completed, completed in a way that can uh, show some bias. Um, when you uh, type in black women, for example, the algorithm for Google might not give you what you expect. So um, we have to be careful, and that's one of the reasons for black women in AI. We want to make sure that we're involved when they're writing these recipes for everyone to see and try and taste. So that's, you know, my take on algorithms. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, great example. We just made waffles, so it was a perfect <laughs> example. <laughs> we made them from scratch. Awesome. So, good example. <laughs> So this hey, is, this is, I have a question. Pop off. Rose, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, I am, um, I wanted to know about um, if there was an opportunity to have this uh, type of workshop um, for, an, for another group. I am the president elect for Black Orlando Tech. And I think this would be an awesome workshop for, um, you know, some of the, um, the women in our in our community, and, but also looking at the young women also. Um, how, I think this would be an awesome opportunity. How so young are, are we talking, Rose? <clears throat> um, it depends on what you guys think is, um, is can do it. I, I think these, these young kids are, are, I think, a lot faster in, in this than at least I am. So they might be able to pick it up, uh, of teens, I'm thinking. But I just wanted to see um, who I need to speak to and if you know about having this type of workshop um, for, for, for our organization. So Jack, I'm gonna defer to you for um, age. Uh, good question about age. I don't have a good answer for now in terms of, uh, it, it's a sort of like, yeah, it's a difficult, um, difficult to answer without more context. Um, I'm always interested in getting people to build more robots. So Carlotta, if it's okay with you, I think we should just, um, you know, maybe offline mm -hmm. circle back with Rose and chat a little bit more about details. Okay. So Rose, I think building the robot, the kids, high school kids would be fine. Mm -hmm. My concern is the, the coding in Ross. So Ross is a little difficult for that age group. It's actually a little difficult for even graduate students. Mm -hmm. However, if we can have this robot, let's say, with an Arduino mounted to it, um, as or Raspberry Pi mounted to it, as um, Angel talked about, I think it would work. I'm okay. not asking Jack to go do that by any means, mm -hmm. but I've, I've taught robotics similarly to this mm -hmm. to high school kids with the Arduino. In fact, the videos that Tamara played are videos from my high school um, workshop that I've done. Mm -hmm. So they build a very basic robot that they then program with an Arduino. And I think for that age group, the Arduino robot is a better option. Okay. Okay. But I definitely do want to look into it, having it for um, the tech professionals or, um, or the Correct. adults in our, in our um, community. Thank you. But, but Rose, but Rose I, I, I think we should just, the details, um, 
the devil's in the details, so we should definitely. Uh, I'm I'm always motivated to get people to build robots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. understood. So, well, I can actually email you the details from when I do it with high school kids to see how this could be modified. Like, I think the slides and all of that would be fine. We just have to modify the platform a little. Okay. Yep, that sounds good. Thanks, guys. So this last slide has our Twitter handles in case you want to reach out to us, as well as our websites, um, Black Women in AI, Black in Robotics, Hackaday.com. Is it Hackaday or Hattabot.com? That may be wrong. It's Hattabot. Uh, Hack Hattabot. Hack Hattabot. Yeah, I'll, I'll type it in the... Uh... I'm fixing it now. Um, there we go. I, I thought that was wrong. Okay, so remember, I am going to be emailing everyone the survey of the workshop after this, and I'm also going to be asking you to share with me your availability for a follow-up meeting where we could finish getting your robot built if you can't get through the instructions on your own, and to talk about software options for getting your robot programmed. Are there any last questions as we're wrapping up? I have a last question. Um, mm -hmm. I know we mentioned uh, Python with Ross. Um, the language I'm more uh, familiar with is R. Um, do people use R at all with robotics? I don't know. I'm happy to answer that one. So Ross has support for a lot of different languages. Um, however, the two most commonly used are C++ and Python. Um, so Unfortunately, I would recommend trying to learn uh, Python uh, with Ross if you do want to program uh, within that framework. Uh, as I was mentioning before, part of the advantage of Ross is being able to use other people's software. And so since not a lot of other people will develop in R, you won't be able to use their, their libraries or their, their platform. Um, also, in the first uh, sort of example codes that we have with Hattabot, it's not using the R language. It is in Python. Um, that being said, it is possible to learn Ross and Python at the same time. Uh, that's actually what I did in my first year of grad school. And I remember it being kind of confusing because I didn't really know what I was learning was Python or was it Ross. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was something I, I uh, was able to, to get through, and I'm really happy I did because Python is a really cool scripting language, and I've been able to write programs in Python for things outside of robotics, and I'm happy I added that to my skill set. And there's, if you're doing R, there's a lot of cool uh, data science stuff in Python as well that might, might be of interest to you uh, in addition to the robotics element. That's exactly what Rose posted in the chat as well, that R is used for data science and data analytics. Right. Thank you. Okay. Anything else as we wrap up? I will follow up with everyone in, in your in email, but you all have my email address as well. And you can always follow us or contact us on Twitter. Oh, step 10, Angel, we didn't forget about step 10. I want to hear step 10 too. So um, Jack, if you could answer Angel's step 10 question and that's where we'll wrap up. Jack, you're muted. Sure. Uh, actually, uh, I'm okay if we can talk about it offline. I know people have to go and all of that, but I'm okay if we can talk about it offline. Okay. That works too. You're so awesome. Thank you, you're awesome as well. All right, I appreciate everyone. I will be sending a survey shortly. I'm gonna actually also send a survey for availability, like a um, who's available kind of time, probably a Sunday afternoon again, just to wrap things up. Between now and then, please try to build as much as you can. Get it through as many steps as you can so that when we meet again, we're just wrapping up the robot and talking about other things. Anything from the facilitators, Simeon? Tamara had to hop off, but is everybody good? Uh, I just want to give a shout out to Haya for still being here. I think yeah. it's now 3 a.m. Uh, yeah. it's, it's pretty late. <laughs> I'm so glad oh, you, and, you know, everyone has been interested to do this, you know, on this Sunday. This is our weekend and you know, we're in a really stressful yeah. time and I'm just really excited to be here and see all the participants and fellow organizers. Absolutely, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna be sending everyone Two things, 
survey and then survey of available time. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks for coming. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.